Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome into the VolQuest podcast. I'm Eric Kane alongside Brent Hubbs and Rob Lewis. We got a, uh, a big show coming up here today, and we couldn't do it without our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions, the presenting sponsor of the VolQuest podcast. If you have a need, give them a call for a free estimate. That's at 865-524-5888 or online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. We're going to talk a whole lot of Tennessee hoops, Tennessee spring football practice, a little Tennessee baseball, but first, some breaking news on Monday afternoon. Brent, um, after uh, five seasons with the program, former three-time national champion as a player, Lady Vol Kelly Harper, is not being retained, will not return for the Lady Vols next year, and the nationwide search for the next Lady Vols coach has begun. Uh, some quick thoughts on the, uh, the, the, the change in leadership for the Lady Vols basketball program. Well, I hate it for Coach Harper and her family. Uh, they were, uh, you know, all invested in everything Tennessee. But it's a, you know, it's a bottom line business. It's a wins and loss business, and uh, she did not move the program forward to the, the way that she needed it to, and, and the way that the expectations were for it to be. Uh, I think Danny White wrestled with this. I don't think this has been done for any length of period of time. I think this is something that he wrestled with even over the weekend. Uh, before making the decision on Monday, uh, she gets $2.2 million or thereabout uh, with a buyout. Uh, and now the, the search is on. And, and the question now is, for the first time ever, are they going to go outside the Lady Ball family? It would appear that that's likely to be the case. Uh, I think Danny White is looking for a proven winner, not an up-and-comer. I think he wants somebody who's probably uh, got some established credentials. Um, so we'll see where he lands and, and see where this goes. Uh, Typically, when you make a move, guys, you, you have you have somebody in mind or a couple people in mind as to who you want to to be there. And in the day and age of the transfer portal, with it being open right now, you got to go pretty fast. I mean, this is not something that needs to drag out three or four weeks. I think you got to go pretty quick in this deal here. So uh, we'll see. Certainly, a, a changing time at, at Tennessee uh, with the fact that it, it might not be someone from the Pat Summit tree that's coaching the Lady Ball basketball program next fall. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you know, five seasons, 108, 52 overall record, 53 and 24 in conference play, back to back, uh, sweet 16 appearances, uh, not this year, but the, but the two pre previous, she, she had a second round exit this year. As you mentioned, I think in terms of Danny White, um, and we'll, we'll see what direction he goes, but this is going to be his hire. Doesn't have to be from inside the family. Doesn't have to be a female, a male, regardless. It feels like Brand he's going to make the hire that he thinks is best, and regardless of who that individual is or where that person is right now. Well, I mean, your investment, Rob, is going to be at an all-time high. You've never invested this much into women's basketball. When you talk about paying $2.2 million for a coach to go away, and then you're going to hire somebody who's going to have a buyout there. That doesn't include Coach Harper's staff. So your investment into this – um, is at a place it's never been at before. Because when Pat Summit um, stepped down because of her illness, you promoted from within Holly Warwick, okay? And then when you went and hired Coach Harper, you got her from Southeast Missouri State. That was not an expensive get. You're spending some real money here for the first time in this program, Rob. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see where you land, and I think it does have to be someone who's not perceived to be uh, a risk up and coming, someone who's got some credentials to them and, and got a resume to them. Yeah, I'm pretty fascinated by it as an as an observer because I mean there are a lot more people that are a lot more qualified than me to talk about the Lady Vols. I'll be very Agreed. upfront about me that. Too. Me too. But I'm but I'm but I'm interested. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, Hubbard. What do you? How do you think Danny views it? I mean, does he? I mean, does he look at it as a showpiece of the athletic department? Is is it important for him? I wonder to raise it to the level, you know, of where it is, you know, historically as, you know, as the most iconic women's basketball program in, in, in history. I mean, I wonder, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to how he views it. Is it important to him, to his legacy as an athletic director at, at Tennessee to, to restore, you know, the, what, what this program was and what it was, was, you know, the absolute pinnacle, the apex. I mean, what every other, you know, women's basketball program strived to be for decades. And I'm, I'm curious, I mean, is, is that important to him? I, I don't know. I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I, I think it's interesting. Well, I, I mean, I think, the, I think the statement he's making right now is, yes, it's important because you're you're going to spend a bunch of money to pay someone not to coach in the program, yeah. uh, which you've, has never been the case before. I mean, you could have waited another year and the buyout drops another <laughs> half million dollars. That's and, a good point. You know, I mean, the bottom line with, with, with women's basketball is it's never going to be profitable. 
Okay. If you win a national title, if you don't win a national title, it's, it's never going to be about making money with that sport. So then it gets back to your question, Rob, what's the priority of the sport? What, what, what are you trying to do? The legacy of the program uh, speaks for itself. When you look at what Pat Summit created, not just in Tennessee, but in the brand of women's basketball, I think the game is growing. I think interest in the game has grown in large part because of, of Caitlin Clark and, Look, look how many people were interested in the, in the Monday night matchup, right, between Iowa and LSU because you think you might have a fight. You know, you know, there's drama. There's things going on there, but there's interest there. Um, and so I think that's why you've got to, Eric, if you're Danny White and you look at this, it's hard to sell someone who's not proven themselves at this level, right? I mean, your no. last two hires – and listen, I, I think the world of Coach Harper. I've dealt with her – on a weekly basis, I, I think she is one of the finest human beings as a coach that I've ever covered. And I hate it that it didn't work. Um, but she's had two opportunities at Power 5 schools, and neither one of them worked out. Uh, NC State and now Tennessee. Uh, you promoted from within with Holly Warlick, which made a lot of sense at the time that you made the promotion. So you've, taking chan you've taken chances with two former players who were unproven at this level. Can you afford to do that at this point in time? I don't think you can, which means you're going to spend more money than you've ever thought about spending in the sport. Uh, and who and who wants to take on the monster of the of, of re rebranding to some degree and rebuilding the legacy that is the Lady Ball program? And, and I think that's going to be an interesting search for Danny White. Yeah, it's tough for sure, and especially anytime you – I mean, not even taking into account the Lady Ball brand, but anytime you hire a former player to come back to your alma mater, it's risky on both sides. And, and you know, Kelly Harper, she was quoted in the release yesterday sent out by Tennessee, said, quote, it was, it's was it been an honor to serve my alma mater and coach Lady Ball program that I love so dearly. I'm grateful for the opportunity my staff have had to lead this amazing group of young women uh, to mentor them on the court as well as provide them with life skills that will benefit them beyond the game of basketball. And we know Danny White, really good at his job, really good at making money and all that type of stuff. And I'm not saying that nonprofit sports are not important to him because, uh, again, he's athletic director. He's got to – he oversees all that. But I'm intrigued to see – I agree with you, Brent. I feel like you're going you're gonna to have to go out and get a proven winner because of what this brand means – if you were satisfied with it, then you would have kept her on for another year. I mean, she just had four 21 seasons and coming off back to back sweet 16. So we'll see what they like to do, but we do know that this brand, um, not just big in women's basketball. I mean, this brand's big in women's sports in general from whatever, everything Pat Summit did here. And, uh, that's, that, that's a tall task to li live up to for sure. So wishing the best to Kelly Harper, Tennessee makes the move there. Um, let's move on here in this podcast and talk Tennessee men's basketball, Rob Lewis, Fun season. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about all that here in a moment. And, you know, one of the better seasons for Rick Barnes here at Tennessee and professionally for him. But, um, you know, Tennessee bows out in the Elite Eight. So very close to the program's first ever Final Four, 72 to 66. And at the end of the day, there was no answer for Zach Eady. He's a really good player. It's also really tough when you can't do anything and, and you send him to the line for 22 free throw attempts. Yeah, I mean, I, I really want, want to be objective here because I, I mean, I think I have a pretty good track record of not being a complete homer, and I'm and I'm and I'm I want to steer clear of that. But man, I mean, just I don't know how you could be an objective observer who didn't have a rooting interest in either team in that game and not think that Zach Eady absolutely got away with murder in that game. And I, I'm I'm not even talking so much about. You know, Tennessee fouling him. I'm not even talking so much about him taking 22 free throws. I'm talking about him knocking the hell out of people and sending them flying. First foul for all Eden day long. that he committed, nine minutes left in the game. How's that possible when you're seven foot four, 300 pounds? Well, when you're the you're the biggest, most physical player in all of college basketball, not in that game, not in the Midwest region, in all of college basketball. And I just, again, I, I'm not blaming it on the rest. And Rick Barnes, I... I to his credit, I give him credit. He 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 steered a million miles away after after the game yesterday in Detroit from saying anything negative about the officials, anything. But I just, I mean, it's again, it's not so much the twenty two free throws. It's the fact that he finished the game with one foul, and in a forty minute game, I bet he spent thirty eight minutes in the lane. <laughs> I mean, it's just I don't. Yeah. 
that to that to me more than the twenty two free throws, the no three second calls, and the fact that he finished that game with one foul to me is amazing. And and again, he's a great player. I'm not. I'm not trying. I, I I really don't want to have sour grapes. And I I think Purdue's probably better than Tennessee, but it was going to be Tennessee was going to have to shoot about sixty percent in that game yesterday t- to win with the way it was officiated with what Edie w- was allowed to do. And it's, I mean, I think Connecticut is is by far and away the the best team in college basketball. But if, if that if, if the national championship gets officiated like that, send send Purdue the trophy. Yeah, I mean, I'm with Rob. I mean, I in in the fact that I mean Tennessee fouled him. Tennessee fouled Absolutely. him a bunch, and they probably fouled him a bunch of times that didn't get called, okay, as well. I mean, it was grabbing and tugging and pulling, and I, I give Matt Painter credit. I think he tried to set a, a, a storyline prior to the game about Tennessee's physicality, so I think it was everybody was a little bit on point with that. It's just – and it wasn't just a Tennessee game, but if you watch Edie play throughout the year, I, I think he's gotten away with a ton of push-offs for rebounds, um, and, and I think that that he's got a favorable whistle, um, and I, I I think that's unfortunate because I think he's such a good player he doesn't need a favorable whistle. One hundred percent. And um, I want to make I want to make it clear, Hubbard, that I'm I'm not trying to denigrate. Uh, no. him the I know, and I'm I'm with you one hundred percent. I mean, he deserves. I mean, he's player of the year, right? I mean, he he's the player deserving. of the year in the country, and deservingly. I got no problem with that. Um, I just don't think he at seven four and three hundred pounds. I don't need think he needs any help. Um, I do think what's going to be interesting is if there's if you're going to beat Purdue, you got to shoot it great from the perimeter. Obviously, the other thing too, Rob. I think offensively, you have to have a five who can face or or, or can make a play from twelve or fifteen feet. That's not just a straight block to block post up guy. Because that's where Edie's going to win. Can you make him play in space to some degree? Tennessee never could do that on Saturday. Adu didn't make the early face-up jumpers. That's not a Waka's game. They just didn't have anybody who could do anything and force Edie to play outside of his comfort zone, which is obviously the painted area on both ends of the floor where he never moves. Um can, can anybody left in the tournament do that? I don't think DJ Burns and NC State can do that, although he's been fun to watch. Um, but somebody has to be able to try to play, make him play defense at a non-comfort level. And I think Kenny Smith said this postgame yesterday, Tennessee was just unable to do that with their offensive production in the post or lack thereof. Yeah, and I, and I take no, and I, I don't think any of us do ever take any delight in being critical of, of a college kid in, in any sport. But man, I mean, Tennessee was going to have to have a. I mean, Jonas wasn't going to have to have a big game, but he had to be some kind of a factor, and, and and he just wasn't. And that was, that was really significant yesterday. And the fact, I mean, you, the kid was a first team All SEC player, and his head coach benched him in in the final seventeen minutes of an elite eight, elite eight game and played a true freshman. That's, I mean, I, I know it's getting talked about some, but that's a big deal. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, in the Creighton game, I understand part of that decision because Awaka was out, was not in foul trouble, and was playing really well, right? And in, in, in the deal, so he, I mean, Jonas watched a lot the second half against Creighton because he wasn't playing really well and, and struggled with the pick and roll stuff. Um, but boy, to, to go and say to JP Estrella. Hey, big man, you've got the national player of the year because I've got I've got more confidence in you defensively right now than I do in, in Jonas Adu. It, it was is a, a first team all right. SEC player. Yeah, it's a significant statement, and um, you know, again, I, I use this stat, Rob, and and it's probably overblown. It's it's probably making too big a deal out of something, but since the start of conference play, Tennessee was six and four. When Adu, Ziegler, and Connect scored less than fifty points combined, that was the magic number. They lost two games after January when they scored more than uh, fifty points combined. That the trio did. They got to forty six on um, on on Sunday, and it just wasn't enough. They they needed no. they needed more points from from Ziegler and Adu to have a chance to win that basketball game. I don't think you're making too much of it at all. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm a long way from being the first person, the only person that stumbled onto this, but I, I think myself and a lot of people in November and early December, were thinking, you know, it's going to be Zakai Dalton and, and either, you know, Josiah or Santi. 
and you know it obviously never you know Josiah started had, had a really nice start to the year but it, it obviously never worked out that way and sometime in December it, it just occurred to everybody that this was a the, it was a three-headed monster but it wasn't the three heads you thought it was going to be it was Adu right. and and Sakai and and Dalton and and I mean I think you're exactly right Robert. I don't think you're making too much of it when those three guys played well and produced Tennessee was hard to handle really hard to handle it because you know you got the 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 fantastic point guard you got a productive big man down low that the defense you know has to pay attention to and it just created space it created room for Zakai to operate for for Dalton to do his thing and yeah as you as you said it just it wasn't the case yesterday a couple of 7-0 runs in the second half uh, of course Purdue into the first half when Tennessee led by as many as 11 with about nine and some change left in that first half uh into the first half on a 15 to 2 run kind of set the table uh for the second half but um it was Edie it was Dalton Connect um you hate for this ride to be over for this team you hate for this ride to be over for Dalton Connect in in this historic awesome year but he did go out being Dalton Connect 37 points and um, it, it felt like Robin, and, and again, Rick Barnes has kind of said this throughout the season at points in times, when he's on this kind of here that he is, it's almost like you still got to try to work to get other people involved because towards the end of the game, he was working so hard to get open just to get the basketball when Tennessee was playing catch up. By the time he got the basketball, a lot of the times the shot clock was dwindling down and he was already tired. Um, you know, we mentioned Adu, wasn't the best game for Sakai Ziegler. Josiah had a good offensive first half. Not so much in the second half. It just felt like Dalton, though as incredible as he was in this game, again didn't have the the, the help that he needed. You know, in the second half to try to play catch up and try to solidify a lead. Well, he one hundred percent did have it. I mean, Tennessee took sixty two shots in the game yesterday, and Dalton took thirty one of them. I mean, that's not that's not how you want to play basketball. And, right. I, and I think you're exactly right, EC. I mean, I think he was worn out. He played thirty seven minutes, and I mean, it wasn't. You know, 37 minutes of standing around. It's like what you're talking about. He's working hard to, to get open, you know, to get the you know, to get the ball and, and to try and make something happen. And um yeah, I mean it's just it it was I, I wouldn't I never saw it coming what he did this year. I mean, I, I thought he was gonna be a nice player just based on what I'd heard. I mean, it, he was phenomenal. I mean, nobody I, 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 Rick Barnes didn't know it. I don't care. What, I mean, and he'll tell you the same thing. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, he, he thought, again, everybody thought Tennessee was getting a good player, but nobody thought that the kid who didn't even make all conference, you know, last year in the big sky was going to be the SEC player of the year and, and do what he did. I mean, it, it was phenomenal. And I can't, I just can't stress enough what it was like to, to watch him. I, we, we won't see it again. We will not see a kid go to Juco, go from there to some mid major where he's, you know, not even an all conference player and then and, and come to a power five conference and do what Dalton did. I, I just do not think we'll see it again. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote it Sunday night. I mean, if there's another one year, I mean, if there's another one year guy <laughs> comes through and, and is that, I, I would, I certainly would like to see what that one year guy looks like. I hope I get the chance to watch him and cover him because yeah. I mean, it was phenomenal what, 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 what Dalton connect did all year long. And, we could talk about him for forever. One thing closing out for me, closing out the Purdue game before we get into kind of roster, big picture stuff moving forward. Rob, I was a little surprised that with Josiah getting off to the quick start and the good start that he got to, that that offensively there was there was a bit of a disappearing. He just wasn't a factor down the back stretch of of the first half and early second half. It's almost like the disengagement of him offensively didn't didn't help Tennessee's rhythm at all and and I don't I don't know what Purdue did to take him away if anything or what you know you got those couple of early looks and then it was just kind of non-existent there in terms of, of him having some opportunities to I didn't think he passed up on open looks I just I mean he went a long stretch before he shot that one 15 footer in the last couple of minutes that he missed which was a good shot but guy he hadn't shot the ball in an hour and a half that was the only shot he took in the second half yeah I, I was really surprised that it, he was not more of a factor when he appeared to be an offensive rhythm the way he was early in the game. Yeah, I agree with you. Because, I mean, we've seen Joe, and I and, and I, I really like Josiah. Josiah has been one of my favorite kids that's come through this program. Great, great guy. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical of him. But when he's we, – we've seen him just kind of, you know, not be there sometimes offensively, mm -hmm. especially in SEC play. But when he starts off solid, then he, you know – Generally, you know, he's going to be a factor. And he was 
I mean, he was solid yesterday early. Three of three. Two, he hit two three-pointers in the first half that were huge, that were part of, you know, Snake in Tennessee to that 11-point run. And more, even more than Dalton, because I, I expect Dalton to go up there and just destroy people. That, that is not a surprise. Even right. whether it happens in the Elite Eight or in, in the Dean Dome or what, he, he will give people the business no matter what. But Josiah, you know, it's hit or miss. When he starts off, you know, like that, then, you know, usually – or generally, I think he gets a little pep in his step, and he's going to be there. So to me, I, I mean, I'm I'm right on board with you, Hubbard. Josiah's play in the first half had me thinking, you know, Tennessee needs that. That's exactly what they needed for him. Yeah, you know, somebody besides Dalton, and then it, it just wasn't there in the second. And it's it's not Josiah's fault they lost that game. I'm not saying that. Right. But if he, it, you know, if he's he was three for three in that first half with eight points, and he took he, one shot in the second half. If he if he scores, you know, eight ten points in the second half, Tennessee's maybe head to Phoenix. And again, you don't have a seven foot four guy on your team, but getting out rebounded forty seven to twenty six oh. is not going to help matters at all. Um, there, there's no. many reasons all uh, you know that you can point to I to mean, say why Tennessee lost this game. But but they, and I don't want to. I'm not saying you know give them a participation trophy or anything. But Tennessee belonged there. They didn't choke. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. they did not choke. They showed up. It was a heavyweight fight. It was a final and, and four. They, and yeah. It was and they and they got beat by a team that is a. You know, may may win the national championship. I mean, there's well, and it's there's and it's nothing a, to hang their hat, heads over. Yeah, after. yeah, and it's a team that's a tough matchup. They play ten times. I'm not sure Tennessee wins, maybe a couple of them, right? Yeah, I mean, because Tennessee great. had to play really, really well to have a chance. But that was a heavyweight fight. It was look, that's what's supposed to happen in the Elite Eight when your bracket goes chalk and it's one versus two. Those yep. are supposed to be Donny Brooks. That was a Donny Brook. You know, you can debate seedings and you know who this that. I mean. The fact of the matter is Tennessee played in the Final Four caliber game the weekend ahead of time, and they they put on a great show. And and it was a terrific basketball game to cap off what I think, Rob, was a terrific season for this Tennessee basketball program. I mean, there's – if you didn't enjoy watching this team play this year, then I I don't – I'm not sure about where you are as a basketball fan because they played a pretty brand of basketball on both ends of the court. It wasn't perfect every night. They lost some games here there. But for the most part, um, man, they were fun to watch. And, and I mean, kind of on that. I mean, this is, I mean, this is the best team in, in program history, right? I mean, that, that's in my opinion, most accomplished team. And it's up for debate, sure, yeah. But most I think, accomplished. I think Rob, you can debate. You know, was Grant and Admiral and those guys more talented one through five? You know, you got. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not old enough to remember. I didn't watch Bernard and 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 Ernie play in person or anything like that to know where that. But when you look at accomplishments, there, there's not a debate in my mind that this is the most accomplished Tennessee basketball team in program history. Yeah, I, I think the Grant Admiral team, I, w- I would love, you know, it's obviously impossible, but it's just barstool conversation, but I would love to see that team and this team play a seven game series. I, yeah. I think that would be an absolute knockdown drag out. And, and no disrespect to the Elite Eight team that lost to Michigan State. That, I mean, they got they got hot. They they went on us run, but that that team was inconsistent. I mean, Hubbard, you were there. I mean, they, they were they were talented. They were lots of fun, and I and I'm not you know taking a shot at them. I mean, they they did what they did, and they were a really good team. But I I don't think you know night in night out they they were as good as this team or or the Grant Williams Admiral teams. And, and this team, Hubbard, you you know, I mean, kids that are eight, nine, ten years old, they're gonna always remember Dalt Connect. Oh. They're gonna always they're they're gonna always remember Zakai Ziegler. I mean, the way I remember Dell Ellis mm-hmm. or, you know. Or, or the way somebody older than us remembers Bernard. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I'm not absolutely. saying Dalton Connect is that, but but in terms of your childhood memory, yep. there's a group of kids that are 7 to 15, 14, whatever. That's their dude, man. I mean, that's that's the guy because he put on a show for them all winter long. And it will never be, I mean, this team will never be forgotten. And that, that I mean, it, it will take some time. People have to get some distance on that. And, you know, fans are disappointed because, you know, the, the, you, you had a great crack at making your first final four ever and, and you didn't, but this team will be remembered super fondly. It'll be remembered like the elite eight team, you know, from, from 2010 or Bruce's elite eight team. It'll, you know, or, or what you thought, for, for any sport. I mean, this, I guess what I'm trying to say, this one's going to go down in the fabric of Tennessee athletics. You're not, this team is not going to be forgotten. Real quick before we let you go, Rob, as, as Brent pointed out a moment ago, let's, let's quickly kind of run down um, some, some roster management. What we do know right now <laughs> is, <these> days. <laughs> uh, well, what we do know is a couple of fifth year seniors are gone. Yeah. And it's going to be, that's all you know in this day and age. Yeah. Three, of, Alton, three of them are gone. 
<laughs> Santi. And then from there, you got to recruit your roster. And then, of course, look at the transfer portal. Yeah, and, what and, directions do you think? Rick and I, and I'm not trying to start any rumors, but you really do just have to. In this day and age, everybody's a question mark. I mean, they just yeah. are. I mean, and I mean, I don't I don't know that anybody's leaving right now, but it's, it's kind of silly to think that somebody won't. Yep. When, when you see what's out there. Um, I mean, first off, I mean, obviously, you got to get some scoring on the perimeter. I mean, you're losing uh, you know, Dalton for sure, but, you know, Josiah, Santi, those guys have played a ton of minutes. You got to get some perimeter help. I mean, Cam Carr, I think, is, you know, assuming he's back, and I think he will be, is going to step up and have a huge role next year, but he's not be Dalton Connect. If Freddie's around, he's he's a he's a guy that I think is a plug and play um, guy in the perimeter, but you, you've got some, you got to replace the production there. And, and then, frankly, I just you just have to wait and see who you get back. I mean, the, the one thing you know, you gotta you gotta get some size and some scoring on the wing. After that, I mean, it, I think it really is a waiting game, and and it, and it won't be a long waiting game. Hubbard, like you were talking about, the same reason that you know Danny White needs to hire a women's basketball coach quick. You know, kids have got to make decisions, and 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 coaches need to know. Yeah, in a hurry they do. I, I'm curious, Rob, just when you look at the makeup, and let's just assume a bunch of guys are coming back, okay? Then we know there's going to be some changes because that's inevitable. C can Jemai Meshack – I mean, this is a guy who was a point guard a year ago in the NCAA tournament. Can he take on the the, the Josiah Jordan-James role moving forward and, and even play some stretch four because athletically he can get the ball to the paint? you know, when offensively and do some things there. He's not a great three point shooter, uh, but he, but he plays more physical than he probably weighs. I mean, wh where is kind of, what's his niche movement? Cause he's going to, well, he's going to play a much more prominent role next year than he did I, this year. And I, I thought think he was you hit, this year. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think he rolls right into the Josiah, you know, Stretch Swiss Army knife plays the four. I mean, at least plays that on defense, at least guards, you know, the four on, on defense. I mean, and I think he's, and again, not saying anything about it. I, I think it'd be an upgrade defensively. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if people really appreciate just what a monster Jemai is. Strength, I mean, strength-wise for his size, his athleticism, and hard, hard worker. I mean, I, I, I think he's, I think that's a seamless transition for, okay. for him to roll in there and and have his minutes. I think average probably 18, 19 this year. I think he's a, you know, 28, 30 minute guy next year i think that's a in i that, think that's probably that rick barnes's easiest easiest move for the guys that are leaving i mean i thought so too but you know he didn't really play that role i mean he played he was a swiss army knife in a lot of places other than kind of there it felt like you know there's a lot of times he's you know again a year ago he was a point guard on this yep. basketball team so um just was kind of curious as to where you thought his next step were his kind of final step and i, and I tell you i mean didn't and another guy, Hubbard, that I think is – I think what J.P. Estrella – I think those 15 minutes he played yesterday, I, I, I think he grew up so much. I mean, he he didn't shut Zach Eady down. Nobody nobody is. But but he he didn't sh he didn't back down from that challenge. He battled, his, he battled his rear end off. I mean, he gave you everything. You, I mean, you, you got that game tied – I guess it was tied for the second time on his dunk on the pick and roll. Mm -hmm. and, and he had given you everything you needed – to have a chance to tie that game and steal it late because of what he had done and just the way he had battled. He had forced Edie to miss a couple of shots because he forced him to turn the other way, and he had just made him work the, the whole time. I mean, I, I I couldn't be more impressed with a guy who played such a minimal role um, to, to come in and and to play in that situation like that was – was just crazy, and I, I, I mean, I thought he did a more than admirable job for the for the role he was put into and the situation he was thrust into. I thought it was. I mean, it's crazy to think he played 15 minutes yesterday. It's the most he played all season <laughs> in the elite yeah. eight. And yeah. assuming that everybody's back, I, I mean, I think Tennessee's bigs next year are are going to be solid beyond. Yeah, solid. You just got to teach Tobey not to foul, man. If he if he can stay on the court, I, I think he's got a chance to be a really. Really good, and I think they've got three three big time post, you know, three real post players there that you can do some different things with. And you can uh, and I think Cade, big I, think, one. I think Cade Phillips is going to be able to help him. I mean, that's yeah. a guy that back in November they probably the, the staff probably liked him more than they like JP in November. You know, JP and I'm not and JP you know kept coming on, but I, I'm really high on Estrella. I love kids that were guards and then grew like six, seven, eight inches like, like JP did it and still have some of those skills. I, I just, I, I don't sleep on JP Estrella. Don't sleep on it. Rob, 
you and Grant love the coverage this year. It was fun watching you guys in the NCAA tournament, and I'm um, looking forward to your coverage on roster management. There's no time off ever, and we'll see what this team looks like love next the year portal. in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> we, we all love the portal. All right, boys. I'll see all you at right. spring practice this week. Rest up. Rest well. See you guys. See you, buddy. And um, as we thank Rob Lewis and Grant Ramey for their coverage, let's give a, a quick thanks to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions for being the presenting sponsor of the VolQuest podcast. Severe weather can strike at any time in East Tennessee, and Mother Nature can do severe damage to the first and most important line of defense that you and your family have against Mother Nature, and that is your root. Whenever she strikes, make sure that you call the people that I call. Make sure you trust the people that I trust. And that's my friends at Exterior Home Solutions because they're more than friends, they're truly family. Again, that phone number for our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, 865-524-5888 or online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. All right, we got a couple of minutes left here on this edition of the VolQuest podcast. Um, scrimmage number one is in the books. They scrimmaged on Wednesday, had a four-day holiday break for Easter, came back and hit the practice field hard and long on, on Monday and uh, gearing up for a practice on Wednesday, and then they'll scrimmage again on Thursday night at Neyland Stadium. Brent, some of the big takeaways now entering week number three of spring practice and, of course, scrimmage one in the rearview mirror. Well, I think for now it's about which of these young guys take a step forward because now you're adding more stuff. Um Guys' heads are swimming a little bit. Who comes out on the other side of that, right? You, you. I think you got a great idea of where you are on the defensive line. I think you know where some of your starters are on the offensive line. I'm not saying you completely shut some people down, but at this point, I don't think you want to risk injury for some guys who yep. who, who you know are going to help you and you know are in good shape. Um, and then it's about you know wh where are you in the secondary with the transfer guys? Where's Chris Brazel, who had a really nice scrimmage? Um, you know, in terms of that that wide receiver competition, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. You've got to figure out what you are at running back over the course of the next two weeks to decide if you need to go portal hunting or not go portal hunting with the injury to Cam Seldon. I think when you look at offensive priorities, that may be the biggest priority left for this spring yeah. because that dictates your next move. You were never going to solve the left guard situation in spring ball, right, Eric? I mean, I don't think any of us thought – they were going to walk no. out of spring and go, that's the guy. You walk out of spring and you you have to make the declaration because the window is there. Do I need another tailback or am I good until Cam Seldon returns late September, 1st of October? Yeah, I mean, I mean you took the words out of my mouth. You, you, that left guard battle is going to go into camp. Those, you know, we'll, we'll see how big the rotation is a wide receiver, but those guys are going to be battling all throughout camp, and Thornton's had a good spring. Brazel's had a good spring. Uh, Staley, Mike Matthews have made some noise. Um, you know, Squirrels there. Of course, you have those two, you know, second-year players going on third-year players, and Nimrod and, and Caleb Webb will be interested to see with them in the second window of the transfer portal. But all those battles were going to linger into fall camp. Um, you got to figure out if, if, if you have confidence in Khalifa Keith and Deshaun Bishop, because if you don't, then you got to go out and get a body in the transfer portal. And, and sure, you don't want to just take a body, and maybe that was poor phrasing, because I don't think they'll take just anybody, but you need to go get some help um, in the transfer portal. So I think that is the the biggest to-do left on the spring um, to-do list, if you will. And then I, I know recency bias here because they spoke yesterday, but some interesting comments coming out of Willie Martinez and some of those defensive backs. Um, I, I think Jalen McMurray, a lot of good things were said of him and he's kind of that third cornerback right now and they like to play four at least they did you know last year before injury but a lot of good stuff coming about Jalen McMurray saying he's the most consistent of all those guys right now but the, the top end high talent of Jamar McCoy I think is going to be fun to watch um Ricky Gibson as he continues to grow and you know Andre Turrentine at safety carrying himself like he is the guy and he is the starter and Jacoby Thomas where's John Slaughter running back secondary some of the same conversations we had coming into the spring but that's kind of what i'm looking for over the next you know two weeks and the last two scrimmages they have before spring practice is all said and done yeah and then i think you know some other individuals who i think have stood out a little bit taking advantage of opportunities i think you know obviously keenan peely is on a on a pitch count if you will they're being cautious there and with elijah herring out that means jeremiah t lander has got a ton of run, you know, yeah. as at the number one, you know, with the number ones. 
I, I think T Lander's having a terrific, a really good spring. I think he and William Inge have fit it off really, really well, which doesn't surprise me. Um, and you can tell just watching his demeanor on the field and the practice field, he, he's a teacher, uh, you know, just a, a film junkie, you know, and, and, and I think T Lander is son of a coach is just a guy who soaks up that kind of stuff. I think, I think that's been a very smooth transition. T Lander and Brian Jean Marie had a great relationship. I think Inge and T Lander have had a good relationship and I think T Lander's earned and garnered a lot of praise by what he has gotten done to, to this point. Um, you know, it sounds at, like at, Evelyn Spillman's having a good spring too. Yeah. I th- you know, for a guy who got here late, I think that he is a guy who plays really physical. And so I think when you look at it, you take that physicality, Eric, and, and you're like, all right, I don't have to teach him that I got to I got to, you know, I might have to tell him, whoa, not sick him. Now it's about him learning to play in the framework. But for a guy who got here, basically the Monday spring ball started, um, to, to make some noise I don't know how much he's going to be in a rotation at linebacker, but with Carter out and some things there, he's gotten more opportunities this spring. It's a great decision by him to get here. I think he's definitely going to be a real factor for him on special teams. And we'll see how much William Inge rotates linebackers. Does he play it like Brian Jean-Marie did, play a lot of bodies, um, or, or does he see a little bit more kind of play your starters and don't have a heavy rotation there? We'll just have to see because we haven't seen that. Uh, you know, he hasn't had the opportunity to show that yet. So, I think all in all, it's been a good spring, solid spring. Some questions that you're dealing with now that maybe you didn't think you were going to have to deal with because of the injury to Cam Seldon. Um, I think your quarterbacks played well, um, and I think you like your transfers. I think you feel like you probably hit some the transfers. The, the Kesselman kid at tight end has been a bigger surprise. He and McMurray have been the two biggest surprises for yeah. me from the transfer portal standpoint. Everybody else had generated some buzz. Those two guys were kind of afterthoughts in a lot of ways going into spring. Those two guys have had two of the bigger springs of any of the transfers out there. Yeah, and it just it, it makes you deeper. I mean, especially a tight end where you and I harp all the time the importance, but also about how thin you are because you play two. Suddenly you have a guy that feels like you can play and depend on in this offense, and, and they always talked about wanting to play three. We've never seen it. I doubt we'll see it, but that's your third guy right there, and so he's, he's had a really good spring, and then – Again, Jalen McMurray. I, I guess I um, I knew that he was a veteran and all that, and you know he kind of said, "Hey, D one ball is D one ball." I recognize this the SEC better players. It's a little bit faster, but um, you know I, I I know what I can do and I know my strengths, and that's kind of what his message was on Monday. And he's like, "And I'm just I'm just excited to continue to grow." And it feels like they like their corners. They're just trying to find that fourth one. Christian Conyer, Jordan Matthews to kind of join the party. Um, but I would agree with you. I think the transfers have been really good so far. They're going to have to continue to come along. This little last stretch of spring practice, man, I would um, – very, very strenuous pitch pitch count, if you will, as you pointed out, for Keenan Peely, for Cooper Mays, um, for Squirrel White, for Dylan Sampson. Bubble wrap. Get in and get wrapping. out. And let these other guys get to work. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, at this point, I don't know that you need those guys need scrimmage work. I mean, like, you just I, I just would be really cautious. Squirrels a little bit different because you got depth at receiver, but boy, at center, I'm not taking chances. I'm not taking any more chances at running back, given my concerns that I have there. Peely, I, I don't need to see a whole lot more, and I want to be careful with those, def- those veteran defensive linemen. I think you got to be smart to the finish line here. Talking about pitch counts. Let's let's make this shift. Let's let's transfer over to a little baseball here as we wrap up the podcast. Uh, who had who had Xander uh, as, as the guy headlining Tennessee's pitching in a series win against Georgia after run ruled on Friday? Tennessee wins a Sunday afternoon slow pitch softball matchup on Saturday. At least it felt that way. Yeah, and, and then they're throwing shutouts on Sunday. Welcome to college baseball, Eric Kane. I mean. College baseball in general is such a funny sport. And you'll see this in the majors too, man, the three game series. And one of these days, maybe not the first game, but one of these games, these teams will get beat, you know, 12 to four. And then, you know, typically they're not that high scoring, but it'll bounce back and win a three, two ball game the next day. Um, baseball is a fickle sport, but what a response and what a gritty series win for Tennessee. You mentioned Xander and I want to take anything away from Xander, but it's also, it's the, as I wrote in the three, two, one, it's the Kirby and Xander show. And Kirby Cannell, what he gave Tennessee on Saturday, five innings. This is a dude that the last two years, last year specifically, would come in for a batter. They would take him out. He was a specialist, okay? He threw 90 pitches, five innings. 
career highs. Xander Seacrest, six innings, 104 pitches, career highs. Combined, they got 11 innings of three-run baseball. If you would have told me that Tennessee would have gotten 11 innings of three-run baseball from Kirby and Xander this weekend, I'll tell you you're drunk. Um, but but g- good for them. They deserve it. They're great teammates. And Tony Vitello mentions those two guys and likes with Trey Lipscomb, who's had a great Major League Baseball debut over the weekend, and, and Drew Gilbert and some of them. So good weekend for Tennessee. you got to figure out some pitching. I mean, I don't think um, – A.J. Causey is going to get rocked like that again. Now, he's not going to be as dominant as he was, but I think that was kind of an outlier. Drew Beam's got to pick it up. He's not looked good in SEC play overall. But this offense continues to show, like, hey, they can kind of pick up the slack when other parts are kind of, you know, not, not hitting on all cylinders, and you saw that a little bit this weekend. All right, so let me ask you this as you move forward. You, got, you, you look on the screen there if you're watching on YouTube, if you're just listening, Tennessee travels to Auburn this weekend. Uh, for a three-game set. This is an Auburn team that's not been very good to start the year. They played the best, some of the best competition in the league. They do have a win over Arkansas, swept by AM, swept by Vanderbilt. Um th- this is one on the road if you're Tennessee. You gotta you, you feel like you gotta get. Um my question is has how where's Tennessee gonna be health-wise going into this thing? I know it's early in the week, but but Terrors is bothered by a hamstring. Uh, Billy Amick's still trying to recover. We know Russell's not going to pitch. But where is this team right now with with a with a no, with no midweek game, which is probably not the worst thing in the world for this team right now to kind of heal up a little bit? Where do you think they are heading into this critical road series where you got to steal some, not steal, but you got to take care of some business against the team everybody's going to expect you to beat if you're the fourth ranked team in the country. Yeah, and I'll say this, Tennessee's overranked, and Tony Vitello would tell you that Tennessee's overranked right now. Number four in the country, it's way too high. I think Tennessee's a top 10 team, but not number four. But anyway, to your point, um, yeah, it's, it's a good week not to have a midweek game. Um, Tennessee's beat up right now. And, they, you know, it's the, the natural grind of a, of a season. Um, but, you know, you, you got Dylan Dryling, who didn't miss a game this weekend. He missed last Tuesday. He was dealing with a little bit of a hammy, and turns out it wasn't that big of a deal. Kavar's tears, the fact that he was able to DH on Sunday, I think was a good sign. He had three hits as well, but um, he had a hamstring inju- injury come up on Saturday night. Um, you got Bargo that's back in the uh, in the in the middle of things, and he's he's looking healthier, which is good. Billy Amick, that's a separate situation. His appendix, obviously, I don't think he's going to play this weekend. Um, you know, we'll see as we get closer to the weekend. But I would say that he misses this weekend, and then he's back. Um, they're obviously going to be careful with that. As you mentioned, AJ Russell is not going to pitch this weekend. I think Marcus Phillips is ready to go. He's, he's available. Um, but just kind of is what it is right now, but it, it's great when you see guys like Hunter Inslee that continues to step up Reese Chapman, who Tony Vitello has now mentioned twice that he could probably, probably play third base if you need him to. Um, he's come along. He's in over 400 right now. Again, you've got a lot of options, and credit the staff for developing, credit the staff for recruiting for these situations. But I do think Tennessee, for the most part, is going to be pretty healthy this weekend, with the exception of Billy Amick. And that's, again, that's not really an injury. That's just a medical issue that popped up. And then A.J. Russell, who's going to be out for a little bit and hopefully get back for the home stretch in May. Yeah, we'll see what Tennessee looks like on Sunday as their to-be-determined pitcher might be Xander Seacrest, given what he did. Should be Xander Seacrest right now. I mean, he's giving you reasons. I'm not going to say he's going to do that every week. Right. But I think he's earned that opportunity for sure. Yeah, I think he certainly has as well. We'll see where where they are this weekend as they take on the Auburn Tigers. Remember, it is a marathon, not a sprint in SEC baseball. But you're, you're, you're heading into weekend number four, right, in the SEC. I mean, we're moving along pretty quickly here. You, you, you got to be growing and getting better and continuing to develop, and we'll see where Tennessee's at this weekend as they take on the Auburn Tigers. We've got that going on. We've got a basketball coach search on the women's side that has people talking. What does the men's roster look like with Rick Barnes and this team as they go through exit interviews and the portal remains wide open? Spring practice with their second major scrimmage on Thursday night. Really the biggest major scrimmage left. No offense to the orange and white game coming up. Lots and lots of stuff, Eric Kane, at VolQuest.com to check out right now. Not just the podcast that we do. Tons of recruiting coverage. We welcome Steve Wilfong to the On3 family, by the way. But tons of recruiting stuff. Tons of football stuff, basketball, baseball. There's a lot going on right now. Yeah, and and again, we know there's a lot of people that listen to our podcast every week, and, and we appreciate that and watch us on 
on YouTube that might not be members of the site. And if you're one of those people, encourage you, man. I mean, you know, right now it's no better time. There's so much happening right now. Your value, one dollar for one month, and even you jump in there for a year subscription, you're gonna get your money's worth. You're gonna join a unique and awesome family that loves Tennessee volunteers and. Um, I'm biased, but uh, I, I think we do it better than anybody in the market, Brent. So all that and more is over at VolQuest.com. Big thanks, as always, to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, for bringing us coverage of this podcast each and every Tuesday and Thursday, 865-524-5888, and online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. For Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys, as always, for joining us here on the Tuesday morning VolQuest podcast. 